But you see, lust is nothing new, and there's a real danger in a believer's life that's been given over to desires that are not from God. But there's also a beautiful vision for a life submitted to the will of Jesus Christ for you in an area of purity. There's a beautiful vision if you follow God's way. Who would have thought that our creator knows the best way for his creation to behave? Jesus had high standards on this matter. Matthew 5, 27, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is a very high standard. Jesus set the standard so high that we're like, oh, that's impossible. He also says, be holy as God is holy. Be perfect as God is perfect. How can I do that? Well, he also gives us a way to do it. And it's not about a life of perfection. It's a life of progression into what God is calling you to be. Knowing that we'll never achieve it. And that's why we have to stay ready every single day because we're in a battle. It's not to say I had 10 great years of being a Christian. I can just relax. This word for lust in the Greek in Matthew 5, 27 is epithemeo which means to set your heart upon, to long for, covet, or desire. Now, this word is not always used in a sexual context. In 1 Timothy 3.1, it's about desiring, epithemeo, the office of an elder. Jesus also said in Luke 22.15, I have desired to eat this Passover with you, epithemeo. And so it's not just a problem of desire, even though Buddhism would tell us that what's wrong with this world is desire. We should strip ourselves from desire. Christianity says that the root of what's wrong with this world is disordered desires, a.k.a. sin. Desire is a gift, but it has to be channeled towards God and the things that God says are good. Lust itself is a strong desire, illicit cravings towards things that are against God's will. It's a self-centered will to pleasure, a me-focused utilization to extract pleasure from others. It's a disordered desire that destroys relationships and it's never satisfied. You see, the Bible's not vague or unclear about lust and sexual sin. There's many, many more verses I could give to you. What happens is when a society or a culture or even a religion creates their own values and cultural norms without a standard of truth set forth from God Almighty, it eventually descends into chaos with people seeking pleasure and personal gain at the expense of others, instead of submitting one's will and sinful nature to the holy nature of God and his will and his plan for humanity. We've seen this time and again, and it's happening with America. The America has descended into this madness without a God standard for sexual ethics. You can rename sin all you want, but that doesn't change the effects that sin has on the human soul and relationship with God. It's not about focusing our limited view of history and longing for back in my day was better because I guarantee no matter when your day was, sin was still rampant. It was just easier to hide and less acceptable by the culture. It's not about what happened since 2020. It's not about who's in office. It's not about what legislation has passed over the last couple of decades. It's not about the sexual revolution of the 70s or about a better picture of family living in the 50s. The concern we have for people today is about a clear disregard for the Bible as the foundation for wisdom, truth, and morality. It's easy to look at society and point the finger. It's important to remember that, again, this is a sin problem that will not be fixed until Christ returns fully. And so I know that my sermon's not going to change the world today, but I am hoping that it changes our hearts as the body of Christ and that it brings us to a point where we're we're seeking holiness. We're filled with the Holy Spirit saying, God, your will in my life, because that will change your world and the world around us in this community and in the city. That's how revival starts. You see, Christians were to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds because the mind is the battlefield. That's where this takes place. And what's important to understand is even if you're not in a discipleship program or have a mentor per se, you are being discipled by something or someone even if you don't realize it. If parents, mentors, and the church is not discipling us and the younger generation, you can be sure that advertising, peers, social media, streaming service, and the smartphone will. You see, we live at an unprecedented time in history thanks to technology with levels of access to anything your disordered desires would want. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, whoever is unite, united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Again, high standard. Now, all sin is the same in the sense that it separates us from God, but there is a harsher degree to sin when it comes to sexual sin because it's a transgression against our body 
which is the temple and the image of God. So that's why this is serious. See, love wants a person, lust wants an experience. We might think that it's my body, my choice, or when it comes to sin, no one gets hurt when it's two consenting adults. But the truth of the matter is that as a Christian, you were paid for with a high price. Lust dehumanizes and love humanizes. And Jesus is concerned with making us people who love. John Tyson, a pastor in New York, who I love to listen to, he says that after 27 years as a pastor, he knows that sexual sin will unleash hell and destroy almost everything it touches. He just knows that. He's seen it. Think about in 27 years as a pastor, what you see time and time again of lust destroying relationship. And so this is a truth for not only him, but it's a truth in the word. So hopefully I've been clear that this is a problem but there is a solution. So how do we solve this solution? How do we solve this problem of lust? In Matthew 5, 29 says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go into hell. And while this is not advocating a literal interpretation, Jesus is teaching with metaphor in a graphic way to stress the urgency of the matter. It's urgent. Do whatever you need to do. It's uncomfortable, something that will be painful in the moment, but will lead you down a path to be free from this. So external changes like action plans and accountability are good to do, but only subdue the problem because we need heart transformation. The gospel is that when we come humble and repentant to God, he meets us with his grace. It's a gift of a new covenant heart. It's what was promised in Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your old heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This process to get there is, can be a one-time moment at the altar when God takes away the cravings and desires. It can happen, but it's also about walking through discipleship, walking through day-to-day. -day. Okay, now that he's taken that away from me, what am I going to fill my time with? What am I going to fill my thoughts with. If the addiction's gone, you have to replace it with something. John Mark Comer says it's far easier to go to church once a week chasing a spiritual high and angling for a download from heaven than to do the daily unglamorous work of discipleship. I love Sunday and I love altar calls and I love all that, but what happens on Monday? What happens on Friday night when you had a horrible week and you just need a little Saturday right before church? I'll repent at church, right? What happens with the daily grind of discipleship is hard, unglamorous even. My dad used to say, he was a pastor, that it's not how high you jump or how loud you shout, but it's how straight you walk when your feet hit the ground. Nothing wrong with praising and shouting. Oh, absolutely not. But how straight are you walking this path? So the question really is for you, Christian, if you keep doing what you're doing for the next year, three years, 10 years, with the trajectory you're currently on, will you look more like Jesus after that time? That's what it is. Progress, not perfection. Do you have things in place now and accountability structures to keep you accountable for the next however long? Jesus was also very harsh in John 8, 44. He said, you belong to the father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Did you know the devil has desires for you? But Jesus has desires for you too. Who will you follow? Lust is a very real aspect of spiritual warfare, and we cannot give the enemy a foothold into our life. We crucify our flesh and we cast out demons. We crucify the part of us that's still not like Jesus crucified every day, and we don't give the enemy a foothold into our mind. Giving into lust repeatedly distorts you as a person. It makes you think that you're alone, that you're the only one that struggles with it, and that you're worthless, and you cannot follow God after all you've done. And so you get stuck in this cycle of sin. Just rinse and repeat. Guilt, condemnation, back to the thing. Guilt, condemnation, back to the thing. And that needs to be broken by the power of Jesus. Lust is darkness that needs exposed, and you need to repent and not just be sorry you were caught, but that you prioritize your disordered desires over the desire that Jesus has for you. John Mark Comer also says, all we can do is set our sin in his light. His job is to deal with our sin. Our job is to confess our secrets. It's to live in a way that is open, true, and laid bare before God and community. All we can do is confess. It's up to God to take that and be in community. Isolation will make this so much worse. Like Job, we need to make a covenant with our eyes not to look lustfully because it often starts with the look just like it did for David. And so making a covenant with it up front before the battle is at your doorstep to plan ahead and make sure that when this comes, not if it comes, I know a way out because God will always give you a way out as well if you take it. Corey Russell says, Christianity is not trying harder, but looking at Jesus more. I like that. But I've tried this. I've tried it. I've tried it. I've repented over and over and over again. Look at Jesus more. Look at your sin. Look at him. And so there is hope for you today. 
keep your eyes on Jesus to know that there is a way out. If you think you've tried everything, don't give up.